I can do scary things. Like I've already done a brain surgery. I've already learned how to walk again. Like what more could you do? Okay, let's try this. And uh, I just decided I was going to move to New York City. And then I did. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 122 of the Strokecast. Mimi Hayes is a bucket of sunshine. She's an author, a comedian, a podcaster, and a young stroke survivor. And if her mother hadn't invented a fake attorney, she likely wouldn't have done any of those things. Since her stroke at 22, she's pursued one adventure after another, and, you know, it's cheesy to say it, but the world is a happier place for it. So now, let's go ahead and meet Mimi Hayes. Mimi, thank you so much for joining us on StrokeCast this week. Thank you so much, Phil. I mean, it, it, I've been following you for ages. I've been hearing about you from, uh, from Joe and the other folks in the community, and it's just fantastic to finally connect. Yeah, same here, same here. Uh, so, I mean, let, let's sort of get right into it then. What was, what was your life like leading up to your stroke? Yeah, so um, I was very focused on becoming a high school history teacher. Don't know why I was so bent on that, but I really wanted to do that with my life. I had gone to college for that. I had arranged for my student teaching semester uh, in Denver, Colorado. I'm originally from the area. So I had gotten about five days into my student teaching and I was having these headaches. I, you know, didn't really take a lot of breaks. You know, I figured this is what teaching did to you (laughs) and your body. I was like, oh, this is really hard. Okay. All right. I'm dizzy and I'm tired and I'm going to bed at, you know, 5 p.m. So I thought that this was all pretty normal. Um, And I was a pretty active person, you know, socially, always going out with friends and always, you know, trying to fit something else into the day. That was pretty normal for me at the time. And actually, around that first week that I was teaching, I went on a blind date through one of the apps, as one does, and I had a really bad headache. And I thought, wow, this guy is really really boring. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if there's going to be a second date, but I should probably go home and, you know, take some Tylenol. That was, it was pretty much downhill from there. So not that, not to blame the gentleman for giving me, you know, a brain hemorrhage, but you know. <laughs> a date so boring, your brain bleeds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so as your uh, as things are going downhill, when when did you realize you needed to be in the hospital? Yeah, so I want to say this was really more of my mother's doing than my own because um, I really didn't think I could do anything about the situation. You know, I thought like, okay, well, this is my life. I'm dizzy and tired, and I have headaches. And she knew right away that something was off. And so she's like, okay, why don't you go to go see your doctor? And I had already actually made an appointment for something else. So I ended up going to the doctor and she said, oh, you have, uh, you know, vertigo possibly. So she gave me some Dramamine, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, Dramamine, great. Uh, All right. And then that didn't work. And I was still, I was getting to the point where in the classroom, I was like, I had to hold on to my teaching assistant to get down the hallway. I was just really like, you know, my vision was going all over the place. I really couldn't, I couldn't operate (laughs) as normal. And um, so we went to an urgent care and again, uh, oh no, the the ER. Yeah, we ended up in the ER actually um, because I was so sick, I couldn't actually move without like throwing up. So it got to that point and my doctor was still saying it was X, Y, Z and no, maybe it's this and it's not an emergency. No, no, you don't need to be in the ER. It's totally fine. Um, And the next ER visit, my mom threatened people with a fake attorney and Mm -hmm. said, if you don't tell us what's up, we are going to sue somebody. (laughs) Right. 
So that was when we got the MRI. That's when we saw that there was something wrong. It was very serious. And, um, you know, we took the next steps from there. So it took, took a few weeks to actually get that diagnosis, Jeez. which is, you know, as I found out, it's not that rare. A lot of other um, survivors have these diagnostic delays, which is pretty scary, you know, so. Mm -hmm. And, and this whole time you're, you're straight up blasting the, the first letter of B fast. Yes. Yes. And I didn't know what that was at the time. And I'm really actually shocked that it went unnoticed because in that first ER, uh, a neurologist came in and said, you know, he, he put his finger in front of me and he waved it around a little bit. And he said, how many fingers do you see? And I said, uh, four, you know, like four of them. Mm -hmm. And my mom had four eyes and I was just like double vision all over the place. And it just didn't, they didn't seem to think that was concerning at the time. <laughs> Taking both the first, but now the first two letters of B fast. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of those things why we come back to this when we talk about it so, so much is that, uh, you know, we've got to be our own advocates and we got to know these signs because it's going to get overlooked, especially for, for younger folks. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was that was basically all I heard for those couple of weeks was you're young, you're healthy, you know, nothing should be wrong. So therefore it, it isn't. Mm -hmm. And that just, I, I settled with that and I was like, all right, cool. Like mm -hmm. I'm just going to live this way because <laughs> I just didn't know how to advocate for myself. I didn't know how to argue with a doctor, you know? So it was all my mother being like, no, actually we are going to figure this out. So I'm really grateful for her. Right. Absolutely. You know, and at the same time, your ability to advocate is probably also hindered by the fact that your brain is bleeding at the time. Oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> that too. Uh, so so do they know what, what caused the bleed? So they are pretty sure, um, you know, it is always sometimes hard to pinpoint sure. the exact um, situation. But what they think had happened was when I was born, a little clump of cells just kind of clumped up. And uh, it's called a cavernous angioma. And it just was in there and just chilling. No, no problems there. Just a little clump of cells. And for some reason, I think stress, you know, a combination of some things going on in my life at the time um, that it hemorrhaged, thank God, inside of that little clump. Um, so it kind of caught the stroke, you know, from going too crazy. It just kind of stayed inside that little clump. And um, yeah. 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 And, th and that's one of those things we, you know, that sounds, you know, really lucky that it was contained in there because I know a lot of the damage from hemorrhagic strokes is not just the, the lack of blood getting to other parts of the brain, but now you've got this clot that can be growing in the brain and there's not room in the brain for other stuff unless you mm -hmm. start crushing brain tissue. Yes. And uh, that was kind of a a concern at the time when they found it was, you know, we can see it in there and, you know, you can go home because, you know, you're stable, uh, quote unquote stable. Um, and we can't touch it right now, right? It's too dangerous to go in there and get it. So sometimes that little, uh, hemorrhage will absorb back into the brain in a healthy way. I'm definitely not a scientist, so mm -hmm. I could be botching this whole thing, but uh, you know, um, they basically said, you know, you can go home and hopefully it will go away. And it actually got bigger, which um, was swelling my brain. So that caused even more issues as I went through my recovery. Right. So, so how much time did you actually spend inpatient then? Um, so I did those first couple of days with the diagnosis. They sent me home on bed rest for about six weeks. I think I lasted maybe four or five possibly at home until I couldn't taste. I couldn't walk. I was seeing double. I, my speech was getting slurred. So now you're more into the be fast, right? Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, so all that was happening. And finally, when I told my um my sister, hey, I can't taste. Ha ha. Isn't that silly? She's like, let's call the neurosurgeon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they decided at that point to um, go ahead and do a um, crani craniotomy. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Uh, craniotomy yeah. or craniectomy. I get those mixed up. 
Yeah. So they, they went in there and took that little raspberry out. And uh, I was in the ICU for probably three, four days um, to stabilize. And then I went into an uh, inpatient rehab center. Um, and that was where the fun that really began. <laughs> well, well, rehab can be um, can be an amazing place because they work you really hard, but you can meet some some fantastic therapists and you know, suddenly for the first time in your adult life, somebody is having to teach you how to walk again and do all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at the time I was such a little athlete, like I was training for a half marathon, you know, because of course, what else do you do when you're starting as a new teacher in your first career? You run a half marathon is what you, sh you, you know, that that was the kind of person that I was, right? I was just like, let's just do it all. <laughs> and my body's like, hey, you can't do that anymore, actually. <laughs> yeah. you, can't do nothing. you can't do anything anymore. Right. Um, so it was really hard for me to accept that and to not accidentally kind of break all the rules in that rehab center and get yelled at because I was just like, what? I'm watering my plants. And they're like, did you notice that you can't walk and that you require assistance? And I'm like, oh, I guess, okay. <laughs> I guess I guess I should stop breaking the rules and listen to you, maybe. <laughs> yeah, because cause, cause when you fall, that just means more paperwork for them. Exactly. <laughs> yep. They were like, you know, it's both of our hides. You know, if you do that, that's really not going to be good for any of us. So you better chill out. So how long were you in there? I was in there for about two weeks, which I think is really miraculous. Um, I would like to thank my young athletic body for some of that because mm -hmm. when you are young um, your brain can bounce back a lot quicker so I was 22 and um, I was in there for two weeks I was relearning how to walk um, I was doing you know all the intensive PT OT I had some speech therapy but that was the one that I didn't need quite as much um, so it was mainly like, okay, so how do you get in and out of this bathtub without ending your life? You know, like <laughs> really, really crazy stuff that, you know, you don't think you have to like learn again when you're an adult. So it was very strange, but, um, uh, I really appreciated that because I know so many people don't get that immediate intensive rehab and, um, we fought for that too, because they wanted to send me home again. And they're like, okay, you're done with brain surgery, go home. And my mom's like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. <laughs> we may have some other things to do because she can't get to the bathroom by herself. So is there a thing for that? You know, so they were really trying to rush me out of there. So um, because I got that, that rehab, it really changed the course of my recovery. Wow. That's amazing that they're trying to push you out. Uh, push you out so fast i mean if if you have the opportunity to stay in rehab you know staying in rehab is you know you're just not going to get that kind of experience uh elsewhere you're not going to get the same level of recovery in outpatient or even in in home care those, those options can absolutely help can and can add a different value but as far as just the core recovery happens rehab is just so powerful for that mm-hmm yeah. And I really do think that, you know, there was a specific physical therapist in that hospital after I got out of brain surgery. And she was the one who said, you know, I think we need another opinion because, you know, the thing is, they don't see you beforehand. They don't see the person training for a half marathon. They don't see what you're capable of. They don't see who you are. They know nothing about you. And then they kind of look at you and you know, they go, oh, yeah, she's up. She can walk. It's like, yeah, with a walker. And it takes her 20 minutes to get anywhere. Like, what are you talking about? She's 22. Like, come on, let's get her into some therapy, you know? So um, I had no idea. This went all over my head, of course. Mm -hmm. And my mother is sitting there, you know, taking notes and making a spreadsheet. And you know, she's like <laughs> ready to sue people. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. What's rehab? You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was a day spa. I was like, no, go to a day spa. It's be nice. I get to relax, you know, and get a massage. She's like, no, this is work. You have to go to work now. You're going to therapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was, it was really, uh, it was really interesting. I'll tell you that. Well, well, I'll tell you, I think one of the things that's really interesting about rehab and the whole experience, especially 
you know, for someone who is always go, go, go and doing tons of different things is that suddenly for the first time in, it, well, I know uh, in my case, uh, first time in my life, I had nothing to do except get better and occasionally update Facebook. Mm, and it mm-hmm. sort of forces you to just take a break from everything else in life. Yeah. And that was both like freeing because I was like, your job is to like help your brain. Your job is to nap. Your job is to eat. You know, like this is what your job mm-hmm. is. And uh, everyone else around me that was my age was like getting married and going to grad school. And like, you know, this was back in 2014. So it was like people traveling, like people were doing everything that I wanted to be doing. And I had a really hard time with that because I wanted to be out there with them doing what they were doing. So it was also painful. You know, it was humbling. It was like, okay, well, this is your journey. You know, like too bad you don't have any of the friends that are going through this, but, uh, you know, they'll come and visit you. They'll come say hi, you know? Um, so I was still just as social, Mm -hmm. you know, well, that's, what's funny too, is I never had a day when nobody came by, like everybody was in and out of that place. Like, you know, to the point where my doctors are like, geez, like you are quite popular, you know, young lady, like you've got everybody up in here. Um, and I'm like, well, you know, I have a schedule. I got to see my people. <laughs> um, doesn't matter if I'm healing my brain. Like I still need to uh, get my friends in here, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so what was your favorite memory from that time? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, favorite memory. I want to say, okay, this is kind of an emotional memory, honestly, um, but I think it really helped me change my perspective. Um, When I first got there, again, I had no idea uh, what this place was. I was truly convinced it was a day spa (laughs) (laughs) and it was a hospital, you know, Mm -hmm. and I roll in there with my wheelchair and um, I'm meeting my um, occupational therapist for the first time. And I had just been, so, you know, they put you on a tight schedule. So first it was PT. So I had my first morning of PT and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do anything. Like I, I can't turn my head, you know, like it was just completely humbling and I couldn't um, walk over these broomsticks, you know, there's, they put these broomsticks in a shape and you're supposed to step over them. And I'm sitting here going, okay, like I'm going to crush this, you know, with my PT today, just not really realizing how how damaged I am after my surgery. And the PT had to hold me up with one of those little gate belts, right? And she's holding me and I'm completely like out of control. It takes me like two minutes to do this. And I'm like, okay, I'm exhausted. I'm back in my wheelchair and I'm like, oh my God, all right, how'd I do? She's like, yeah, the average time it takes for people to do that is eight seconds. And I'm like, what did I do? (laughs) She's like, two minutes. And I'm like, okay, that's our starting point, right? Mm So I'm completely deflated, you know, in the morning and I roll up to my occupational therapist and she just gets down on my level and she kind of kneels and looks me in the eye and she's like, you are really brave and you are really strong. And she'd heard about my story. She'd heard about how many people didn't believe me, how many people, you know, discredited me, how hard it was to even get therapy, you know, and everything I'd been through. And she just looked at me and said, like, you were really brave and you're really strong. And I just started weeping. So I was like, what? No, what are you talking about? I can't even like lift my head like off of my neck. Like, that's not true. Um, But it was such a beautiful moment because she just saw something in me which I didn't see, which was that I was really strong and that I was going to overcome this just like I had, you know, everything that had happened before that. And she kind of just saw me. And that was the first time I was like, wow, somebody actually gets, you know, they see something in me that I can't see. So that was a really beautiful moment. Maybe not a favorite because I was like really (laughs) miserable, (laughs) but it brings me, you know, it, it warms my heart now, you know, thinking about her. So. Well, that, that's a foundation. That's something that then you can build on for the rest of everything going forward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, so, I mean, after those two weeks of that intense time and uh, most disappointing day spa ever. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Zero stars. <laughs> Sure, if you've had a stroke, great. But if you just want a mud wrap, 
pass. Not for you. <laughs> so, so, I mean, what deficits did you end up leaving with when you transitioned back to back to home life? Yeah, so I uh, I did require a couple months of outpatient, which they still offered at that hospital at the time, which was incredible. So I got to go back for a couple months, you know, a couple days a week, a couple hours here and there. Um, and they worked on continuing to get me back to what I needed to do everything that I had done before. So um, my vision was completely sideways and double out of surgery. And within, I don't know, six months, I was able to uh, work with that OT to get my vision back to singular and upright, mm. uh, which is incredible that your eyes can do that. Um, and she only did that with a little piece of tape that she put on my glasses and she kind of, you know, made the tape smaller and smaller until um, I didn't need it anymore and I could see just fine. Wow. So the vision piece was really interesting for me. And eventually I had to do the tests to make sure I could drive again. One of my therapy things I did was also a lot of executive functioning, which is kind of that frontal lobe. So again, the swelling really kind of impacted all of my brain. But um, up there in your executive functioning, it's like, okay, if you're going to be a teacher, how are you going to plan a lesson? And what is that going to look like? And, you know, what are you going to do when this happens? And, you know, they actually, I sat down with them with this big kind of document, this big requirement to get my teaching license. And it was this big book and I had to do everything inside of this book and all these essays and I had to record myself and send in these videos and they looked at me and they're like is this a joke I was like no I had to do this to be a teacher like this would be hard without a brain injury let's <laughs> let's get it let's crush it you know <laughs> like, this is terrifying mm -hmm. and so we worked on a lot of that kind of stuff about focusing um and you know, keeping my attention on point, my balance, my midline, I had to get all of that back, my gait. Um, so, you know, we'd walk on the treadmill and, okay, now turn your head while you're walking, see if you can do it without falling over. Okay. You know, all the classic, really, really tried and true PTOT and speech. And now I would say I'm, I'm, I just hit six years out in October of 2020. I would say my deficits are pretty minimal, but my balance is still shot. <laughs> you know, I had to relearn how to type um, incorporating my left hand in because I didn't know what my left hand was for after brain surgery. It's just sitting there, you know. Uh, so I had some of that left side neglect. Um, my vision, obviously, uh, my balance fatigue is huge for me now. So I definitely learned to take naps when I needed them and not feel shame uh, for being tired and that my level of tired was truly different than other people's and that it was okay to, you know, rest was the biggest thing I had to learn. That neuro fatigue is really just, just something special. It is truly a beast. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> So here you are now, six years on, and it, it sounds like, are, are you still seeing then gradual improvements? You know, that's a good question. Um, so a year after, I was still doing some PT, and I had started teaching again. So I did get back to the classroom, actually, which was pretty mm, exciting. Cause that's pretty amazing. All those those kids that had seen me those five days got to work with me again. And there, I was like, Hey, I didn't die. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, wow. Like, oh, you look a little different. I, sure I, I teach okay? adults for a living. I can't imagine doing teenagers. <laughs> yeah, they were, these teenagers were actually pretty sweet though, because they had been informed. They were kept up to date by the other teacher, you know, what was going on with me while I was in the hospital and doing all that. And they sent me cards and, they were actually very gentle uh, in terms of being a first year teacher. They were like, okay, she almost died and we could be responsible because, you know, we were there and maybe we were too hard on her. You know? <laughs> so they were actually pretty sweet. Um, awesome. And then the, the following year I um, started a new school and um, started teaching full time, which was a kick in the pants. Um, and during that first year of teaching my own classroom, I was trying to go to PT um, after school that was just kind of down the road from my 
my school and I found that I would get there and I'd be like, yo, bro, I can't do anything. I'm so tired. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't touch my, I can't, you know, touch my nose or my, my finger to my nose and, and be on one foot right now. Like I need to go to bed. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's 4 PM and I need to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't very effective for me. And, um, after I had to stop going, cause I was like, you know, I can't even give my all, you know, um, right. at PT. So that, with that, I just kind of kept pushing forward until I eventually burned out <laughs> as a teacher. <laughs> uh, so I lasted about two years uh, wow. in that career. So that's pretty, that's pretty impressive that you lasted that long. So I mean, I know. <laughs> so so I mean, you're going through this. You're um, living in pleasant Colorado Springs area, and and so in order to sort of recover from your burnout and uh, sort of continue to deal with the fatigue and recover, you decide to move to the idyllic, slow-paced community of New York City. Now, <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I'm a Queens native. I grew up in the city. I love the city. But Mimi, what the hell? <laughs> yes. So I have to, I have some explaining to do, I realize. Um, yeah, so... Really, you know, we had to back up a step. And um, when I was first diagnosed, my friend told me I should write a book. And I was like, well, nothing else I'm doing. Just sitting here with my little bleeding brain. You know, (laughs) I might as well tell the story with one hand because I cannot use my left hand at this point. So I started writing the book um, that was just kind of a joke at the time. But I was like, well getting dark here you know it was kind of this dark humor this this realizing that i my body was changing my life was changing um you know this self-reflection that i'd never done before and blah blah blah, get through all that stuff all that crazy i'm i'm kind of still writing while i'm going through everything so it's very like raw in the moment so i still like had my mom bring me my laptop when i was in um rehab, right? Because I was like, oh, I'm going to write a chapter about this weird person I just met, you know? Like, <laughs> So I, I was doing all that. And I was I was really kind of it was bringing me a little bit of excitement. And um, then I get to teaching and writing just goes out the window, because I am just so, so distraught at trying to survive as a first year teacher with a brain injury in a uh, high need school. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to survive each day. And I kept, you know, kind of still trying to write on the weekends. And um, I had started doing stand-up comedy. So I did that. Again, things that don't really belong in this story are <laughs> finding their way inside <laughs> of this story. <laughs> um, but I was kind of just building this, like, creative life, like, moonlighting outside of the classroom. And it was really fun and exciting. But again, I was just like, wow, I'm so tired. And it got to the point where I was sitting with my best friend in a cafe and I was like, I am miserable. I can't keep up. And also, why am I doing this? Like, why am I still here in the classroom when I have this, you know, calling to do something else? And she's like, well, you should quit. And then I was like, oh, hmm. I didn't know I could do that. Okay. Uh, Now what do I do? If I was going to quit, what would I do? And for some reason, the first thing that came in my mind is go to New York City. Uh, because <laughs> I had been there once before. Um, I had taken an improv comedy class um, about a year after my injury, actually. And I remember being so scared. I was like, wow, this city is too busy. It is so loud. It is so crazy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I got to go home. I mean, I, you know, it, I, it was fun. It was, mm-hmm. it was so fun. But it was, it was also really scary. And there was something about like, well, I can do scary things. Like I've already done a brain surgery. I've already learned how to walk again. Like what more could you do? Okay, let's try this. And uh, I just decided I was going to move to New York City. And then I did. <laughs> that's, that's, so, that's, 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 that's amazing. So <laughs> when, when you get to New York, then you're, uh, I mean, did you, you, you were, you worked as a nanny. Um, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> did Did you then just start diving into the stand up scene, or focus on getting the book published first, or what was what was sort of happening at at, at that point? <laughs> I 
everything at once. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I got to New York and um, I did try to get like writing jobs. But of course, I had no resume for that kind of thing. So I did not get those jobs. Because I wasn't a writer, you know, I was I was a teacher, and I didn't have anything on my resume that would suggest otherwise. So uh, I ended up being a nanny, and you know, they got they got a good nanny. You know, it's yeah. like she's a teacher, she's like fun, like she's crazy, she's got this comedy thing. So I was having a blast, you know, just working with these these little kids every day. And in the meantime, I was like hustling in the evening and doing open mics and you know booking shows and going all over the place uh, as one does in the city. And it was just, it was wild. And picking Um, up a little bit of the accent while you're there. Yeah, just a little bit, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But when I started uh, at an improv theater that actually no longer exists, but uh, at the time it was kind of this indie pop-up like improv theater um i was trying to make friends and so i was hanging out with everybody after the show and this guy's like hey like what do you do you're new like he was really welcoming which i wasn't like prepared for because i was like oh everyone's gonna be so mean uh, <laughs> but actually everybody was so nice to me <laughs> um so he's like what's your story what's going on and i'm like well i'm writing a book but you know nothing to say nothing to see there you know it's not published it's not real it's just yeah. you know it's a thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, well, wait a minute, you know, like, what is that? And I told him about the, the the brain and the story and everything. And he's like, hey, well, I know a publisher. Like, do you want me to email him for you? And I'm like, yeah, you could do that. You could email a publisher. Great, great. And uh, that became my first book deal. So it was just like, I never expected it would come that way. I was not prepared for it to happen that way. Um, but that was kind of my little break into um, indie publishing. So so, so that's, that's one of those things, too, where you didn't actually then have to go through the process of deciding, do I want to use a traditional publisher? Do I want to publish it myself? You just had this, were able to uh, have this contact with this publisher and you had done enough writing at that point that uh, you were able to, you know, put together something that they're like, yeah, let's, let's make this a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I had kind of jumped the gun maybe like a year into writing the book. I was like, Ooh, I'm going to like get an agent and I'm going to, and the book wasn't even done yet, but this is what you do when you get excited. You're like, Ooh, I'm going to, it's going to be penguin random house. It's going to be this, it's going to be a bestseller and a movie. And I've got like 30 of those plans already written out. Yeah. And it's, it's fun to really dream like that. So I was just going big, but, um, all the agents that I reach out to, you know, rejected said, no, you know, interesting story, but not for me. And so I just kept plugging along, kept writing, kept editing it, rewrote it three or four times. So by the time I got to New York, it was like a book, you know, it was like, this is a really good manuscript. Um, so it was just kind of one of those right place, right time. Um, yeah, kind of things. So, so, uh, what is the book about? So it is called I'll be okay. It's just a hole in my head. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and it is the story of my, um, my kind of first year of that whole experience, um, being diagnosed with a brain hemorrhage. Uh, the first part of the book also deals with a heavy breakup. So I had also ended a relationship with, um, someone I had dated for about five years and thought I was going to marry. Right. So that happened right before my head exploded. So I was like, Ooh, double whammy. Uh, so (laughs) I kind of go through this heartbreak and this head trauma and I am trying to figure out who I am and what's going on with my body and um, where I belong in the world. And it deals with, you know, thinking about mortality when you're 22 and and what kind of thoughts go through your head when you think you're going to die for the first time. And how are those weird and how are they funny and how are they sad? And, you know, it's like, it's deeper than I ever thought I could go. And so I think that came out of truly writing it when I was going through it. I don't think I could write the same book a, I don't have the memory. I couldn't remember half that stuff. Um, but really, it's raw. It's, you know, in your face. And it's 
it can be hard to read sometimes because a lot of people are like, that's what happened to me or a parent, you know, my, my parents still, you know, they love the book, but they're like, it's hard to read because we experienced it too, you know? So, um, but it's got a happy ending and it's also kind of a, um, a tale of like self-discovery and self-love and how you can love yourself with a disability. Um, and, kind of coming to terms with who you are now versus who you were before. So it's, it's pretty good. I got to say, I'm pretty proud of it. Awesome. Awesome. So it, it gets deep. It's uh, this powerful memoir. It's about mortality. And as a comedian, then is it funny? Oh, it's so funny, Bill. It's so funny. It makes me laugh. Actually, there are so many times that I'm caught off guard by my own funny thing I said. And I'm like, oh my God, I forgot I wrote that. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so that, that, that's great. And I think, uh, you know, I know it's, I, I've always felt that when you're dealing with a lot of this stuff, uh, yeah, if you don't, if you don't laugh, you cry. So it's always going to be one mm -hmm. or the other. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Sometimes at the same time. And that's <laughs> totally okay. So or how much of the stroke experience is is in your set? Yeah, so that's actually interesting too, because when I started doing stand up, I was only doing the like brain bits, right? I was like, I had a stroke. Ha ha. <laughs> People are like, What? That's not funny. <laughs> and it took me like such a long time to and I actually got scared. I got really scared because I was like, nobody else is talking about the brains exploding. So maybe I should like talk about doing yoga or like being a white girl or like being a teacher. Like maybe I should be more, you know, palatable, I guess. And so I kind of, I kind of scooted back from the, the stroke stuff. And it wasn't until I was in New York working one of my side jobs, which was teaching a comedy writing class in the Upper West Side that one of my, I was telling my students who had never written or, you know, done stand up before, but they were really smart people. And, and I was like, yeah, you really need to be yourself and be authentic. Like you are you, like you are the only you. And they're like, yeah. So what was your last set about? Uh -huh. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Cause they knew my, they knew my story. Right. And I was like, um, doing yoga. And they're like, you are so full of it. You better get on yourself here. You better get back to that brain stuff and figure it out because that's who you are, you know? So they really called me out and I had, I had to really grapple with that and go back to um, thinking about how do you make somebody laugh about something so heavy and something so difficult. And a lot of it is just noticing the audience and being like, okay, so this girl's face has gone like a sheet of paper white. Cause I just said that my brain exploded on a blind date. So I'm going to turn to her and say, honey, it's okay. Look at me. I'm okay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> have to like mm -hmm. literally break the wall and and actually read their emotions because that's a big part of the comedy that I do is is telling them like this is a hard topic and it's going to be hard for you but I need you to laugh at it because I survived and that's okay you know so um it's taken me a long time to learn and certainly my last set before the it was it was right at the heat right before the big lockdown in New York City mm -hmm. and I had a show in a club and it was a sold out club it was like you know 250 people in there and I knew with everything going on with the pan with the the disease, I was like, you know, I don't think I can tell my brain jokes tonight. You know, I don't think it fits for the mood because people are actually dying and people are really scared and I'm scared. So I talked about auditioning for The Bachelor and uh, it went great. And, you know, like I, I, I can adapt that way because I know I can read. I read the room and I was like, you know, I'm going to I'm going to do a change up because they need something light and funny. They don't want me to talk about, you know, COVID. They don't want me to talk about, you know, a near death experience. What they need is just a little bit of light and a little bit of funny. So here I am auditioning for The Bachelor. <laughs> So well, I've got well, lots, lots, lots of content, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I would say there's, I definitely always want to, uh, lead into what makes me unique, which is the stroke, uh, content. And, and just as you continue to live life, you do pick up all of these other experiences as well. And I think that's, I think that's important too, because you, you know, it's not, you know, our, our, our strokes have certainly set us on these paths, 
But along that path, we do pick up all sorts of other experiences that we can talk about as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think being like niche is good. But, you know, again, I am just always gathering more and more content. You know, I didn't ever ask for the content, but it's here. You know, crazy things happen to me. I write them down, <laughs> I catalog them <laughs> and uh, try to make people laugh about them is kind of all that I want to do. Well, well, I think another great example of that outside of our, our direct realm, your stroke doesn't shock us as much anymore because this is our world. But if you want to see how the audience might experience that, uh, go ahead and check out Tig Notaro's stuff about her cancer experience. Mm, yeah, she really, she really kicks, kicks butt. She is incredible. And, and, and we've seen her now on, on Star, on Star Trek Discovery, which is awesome. Oh, really? Yes. Yes. She, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> she's, she's a recurring character. And I think uh, season one, uh, and she is just fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that for her. <laughs> so, I, I mean, as as you're going through this, and wh why did you first get up on that stand-up stage? Mm, I think it was like a coping thing. <laughs> it was like, I think I was also trying to convince myself. Like, because as I was, you know, going through my recovery, I was always making really dark jokes because I really couldn't cope with the reality, which was, this is scary and your life might never be the same again. And, you know, you might lose friends over this. And, you know, all these things were kind of floating around in my brain. And I was like, I choose not to go there. I'm going to make fun of the fact that when they told me uh, in the ER that I had a brain hemorrhage, the nurse walked out of the room and like she had to go eat a sandwich because she's like, BRB, are you good? You're good, right? And she just left me there to have like a panic attack. Now that's totally not funny, <laughs> but, and I've got her examples, obviously, sure. but you know, I try to set it up where it's like, you know, here's this thing that I choose not to acknowledge as scary. And I'm just going to you know, deny the entire thing and make it funny because that's better for me. <laughs> You're going to go get your own sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, you're good, right? All right, be our be your back. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's like, I was just still really coping. I was still trying to understand, you know, how I felt about those things. And so when I got up on that first stage, um, I think I got, maybe a couple awkward chuckles and oh and you know like shocked faces and um you know just different things and you know things that a lot of people i i think can resonate with um even if you haven't had you know a major uh health trauma is like dealing with people and so you know rude people or people that you don't like or people that you can't really say you know, you're making me feel uncomfortable, you know, you have to like play nice. And so there's a lot of like social aspects and behaviors that we all do uh, when we're encountered with something so strange. So um, I do get a lot of people that come to me after I do comedy and a they say, I'm glad you're okay. But they also <laughs> say like, Oh, like, my so and so had a brain hemorrhage or uh, blah, 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 you know, or, or they themselves. And it's like, if I can reach somebody like that, that's, that's pretty big for me. And that's why I still want to work it into my set, you know, as much as I can, because it does help people realize like, you're not alone in this. It's okay to laugh at it. And it's okay to process it as you need to. Absolutely. In well, I mean, in the US alone, 800,000 a year, 25% uh, of all adults will have a stroke in their lifetime. And yet, it's still you don't hear about it nearly as much as you would think considering how prevalent it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you ask somebody, you know, they, they know someone, Yeah. you know, whether it's them or it's not, they, everyone knows someone. So it's really not that rare. So, I mean, what, what's been the most exciting thing about doing the standup? Mm, well, for me, like I've always been an attention person <laughs> <laughs> where I've been a on stage, you know, I, I always did theater growing up um, and sports and everything because that's me. <laughs> um, but I love being on stage. I love making people laugh because if I caused you to laugh, it makes me feel like I'm on top of the world. 
and I feel like that first laugh I think is what breaks it for me because I'm always nervous going on stage I'm always nervous no matter if it's like a coffee shop and there's two people in the back and they both work there or if it's you know a club with 300 people and they're taking notes on my performance I'm always nervous you know but just that first laugh I just kind of ease back and go yeah you're good you're funny look at you girl go girl get it you know (laughs) <laughs> really pump myself up and I feel like I'm doing something that I'm supposed to do. I feel called to that. And I felt that way in the classroom too. I say that that was kind of my like my backdoor way of, you know, being a performer was being a teacher because I was like on a stage and I was like, "Hey guys, how you doing?" and I do these like goofy moves and then they would laugh or they would be like, "You're lame. Please stop <laughs> looking at me." Uh so <laughs> You know, I think I was I was kind of testing a bit of my, you know, more G rated material on them sure. uh, early on. And so when I when I became a stand up, I mean, I was I was a stand up while I was a teacher. But um, when I moved to New York, some of those high school students were like, what? You're cool. I never knew. And I was like, really? You spent every day with me and you didn't realize that I was funny and cool and amazing. OK, that's on you. Like, that's on you. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> But really, you know, if you can make like a 16 a year old, like crack a smile, like at, you know, 7 a.m., like you are probably the world's best comedian. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, today, are you a comedian who writes books or are you an author who does stand up? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I've always felt more like a writer. Um, because stand up is, I've never felt like I fit that mold per se. Like improv was also a bit different, um, that I was playing with others, right? I was like engaging. It was kind of this community. Um, stand ups tend to be like a bit more solitude. And that's all cool. That's all fine. You do you, you know? (laughs) Um, so I really like enjoy probably the writing process. And I would say if I could, I mean, sustainably, probably I would I would choose like the books and then performing um, second. But, you know, it's there are two really interesting things. And I've also done like things where I I read a chapter of my book once, like at a cafe. (laughs) And like, you know, I also enjoy just doing weird stuff like that, where I'm like, oh, look, this person's like not really listening to me, but they're kind of smiling. And I can tell that they like, no, that was a funny line. And, you know, like maybe they'll, maybe they'll look the book up later. You know, we'll see. Um, But I do enjoy bringing my books to my comedy shows. And then I give it to the host and I say, can you just hold this on stage and say that I wrote it? And, you know, (laughs) because... that's a prop and it's colorful and maybe they'll come to me after the show and they'll buy it. So uh, it's kind of a nice way to like sell books when I'm performing. And um, if people are like curious about my story, they're going to want to read the book. So it's like, it kind of, it comes together for me in a really cool way that um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm shocked and amazed that I did this for myself (laughs) considering everything I've been through. It's still kind of cool to be like, Oh, you're this person. That's cool. (laughs) And it gets to call their attention to the brain costume. Oh yes, Bill. Have you seen this costume? Uh, I've, I've, I've seen some of your pictures of it and this thing (laughs) is just, just amazing. Yes. Talk about getting inside your own head. Yes. So this is actually, that was actually a creation of my father. Um, the Halloween, cause I had surgery October 3rd, 2014. So that Halloween, I was like, I'm going to be a brain end of story. And I kind of meant like, let's get like a brain t-shirt or let's like make a hat or something. I really wasn't thinking it was going to be this extreme, but my father is an architect and my mother is a little crafty, crazy lady. So (laughs) they were like, let's do this for real. And it is actually like a huge foam, like industrial foam glued together, shaped with a electric a uh, turkey carver <laughs> and and painted and has a little band-aid on the back which actually this is really funny to me now I didn't realize this until about a year ago so my injury um was on the right side of my brain which would mean that my left side was was the deficit side and the band-aid should be on the right side of my brain right on the little right pocket of the cerebellum back there and it's actually on the wrong side 
<laughs> so I learned that um, in the middle of a one woman show in Scotland. And I was like, the baby's on the wrong side. So you know, it's just a giant foam brain costume that I actually got to uh, take to Scotland with me when I did my one woman show, um, how, how which is you, different than my stand up. Yeah, it's different. How do you even pack something like that? So it was in a hockey bag. Mm. <laughs> they used to play hockey. <laughs> so we have all these hockey bags sure. in the basement. <laughs> and I got it on the plane. I, I checked it as a bag and had it in this rolly hockey bag. And the bag is so big, actually, that people were like more freaked out by the bag than the brain itself. <laughs> like if I was carrying the bag, they're like, there's a dead body in there. Like if, if I was wearing the brain, they were just like, oh, it's a weird girl in a, in a big phone brain or flash. Maybe it's a raisin, like almond. Like I had all kinds of guesses, you know, but uh -huh. you can pretty much tell it's a big brain when you come and talk to me and then you touch it and you know it's it's all kind of a thing <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna have some pictures of this over at uh, over in the show notes uh perfect so so speaking of the brain then you also host the mimi and the brain podcast so yeah why did you decide to start your show oh you know boredom mostly because <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's not I enough was... going on in your life <laughs> oh clearly no i was like finished i finished my first round of edits for the book during that kind of 10 months of like the publication before it came out. And I was like, well, I'm done with that. What's next? You know? And it's like, and a friend said, Oh, you should have a podcast. You know, all the comedians have them. <laughs> um, so I was like, all right, well, what would it be about? And it's like, well, you like brains. I'm like, okay, cool. But I can't just me just talk about, you know, like what else? So it came to my uh, attention that there were these people called neuroscientists <laughs> and that I could talk to them. And, uh, you know, I weave in my story. I weave in some of the, the nitty gritty details of my brain injury, but I really want to talk about these big topics with people that are experts in those topics. So I've talked to so many cool people who have just taught me so much about the brain. I am not an expert. I am not a scientist, but these people are. And, uh, it's fun because you're talking to me. So it's, uh, it's me in the brain. Uh, it's all, I do it by myself and I put out three episodes this year. Woohoo. Nice. In 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm a pretty slow podcaster, but I blame some of that on my brain injury, but, uh, you know, keeps me busy. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's amazing how many, uh, brilliant people in their field, when you want to talk to them on a show, say yes, just when you ask. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How's the podcast been helping with your recovery or with your life today? I think it just has really engaged me in science and like the whole aspect of like what our brains can do. And I've always been a really curious person. You know, I taught history. I was always into really nerdy kind of like stories to teach my kids. And, um, you know, I, I actually got this is a really cool thing. I, I interviewed um, Sam Keen, who's a best selling author of uh, The Tale of the Dueling Neurosurgeons. And I actually had uh, included some of his book in my curriculum when I was teaching psychology the second year I taught. And I was, again, <laughs> it's way before I ever went to New York, this way before all that crazy stuff. And when I got to thinking about my podcast, I was like, I wonder if I could reach out to Sam. You know, like he's this really amazing science writer and he just knows so much about the brain. He would be such a great, uh, you know, guest. And like you said, I reached out to him. I was like, hi, I'm a person and I would like to interview for my thing. And he said, yes. And I was like, totally blown away. I was like, what? You're a best selling. What, what are you? What? What? <laughs> That's crazy. Like, what is wrong with you? Yeah, I'm like, don't you know I'm a nobody? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> but, you know, I think people also really want a platform to talk about their science. And um, that was one of my my favorite episodes. So, um, yeah, you know, I've talked to amazing people about it. I think I've learned a bit more about my brain. Obviously, you know, there's some uh, getting a little bit of free medical advice in there, too. <laughs> like, do you know anything about my double vision? You know, like, <laughs> and they're not doctors, you know, so it's like they can only give me so much. But I think it's helped me. Um, also realize that I am creative in more than just one way. And that's kind of why I do all this stuff is because I, I try something, I like it, I realize, oh, this is fun, and I'm good at it. And then I do it. 
Um, and so it's just kind of about jumping into the void and being like, all right, I'm starting a podcast. All right, I'm writing a book. All right, I'm going to New York. You know, it's just like, I just do that kind of crap all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I encourage people to do it, but also try not to, uh, you know, burn out. And that's why I, I pace myself. And I say, you know, you don't have to be like the best at everything. You can just do a little bit of everything, you know. <laughs> so for the uh, for the per- for the survivor that who wants to start their own creative project or write their own book or memoir, uh, what recommendations would you have for them? Oh, just do it. And like, hit me up. Like, let's talk about it. Like, I love um, encouraging those people. And I think, um, I think some of the fear to not start those things is that, well, someone's already done it, right? Like, there's already a book about strokes out in the world. There's already, you know, someone who does comedy about XYZ in the world, you know, I shouldn't do it. But there's actually space for everybody. And everyone has a very unique take. Like you are the only one that could tell your story. And whether you do that through painting or pottery or a podcast or, you know, a book, um, you have every right to explore that story. And there's going to be somebody who's going to see that and they're going to go, Oh my God, I can tell my story. You know? So it's kind of this blooming effect. And I just, I love when people come to me and they tell me they want to write a book about their stroke and I'm like, yes, let's do it. You know, I'm like, okay, let's, let's, you know, and I coach people like that too. And so that's been a part of my journey too, is, is teaching in different ways and bringing that first career into other aspects of my, my other interests and my other, you know, jobs is trying to um, encourage people and just say, Hey, you know, you can do that. It's not impossible. And I'm, I'm, perfect evidence of that, right? Like I shouldn't have been able to do it, but I did. And that's a lot of our story is just overcoming those things. So I'd say go for it, dive in. If you're scared, if you're nervous, hit me up and I will, I will encourage you and be your little accountability buddy. Uh, (laughs) So we all need that. It's January, you know, like we're ready to get on uh, with our lives and do new amazing things. So um, I encourage people to do that and pursue that. So, so folks may remember we had we talked with uh, Jane Connolly uh, a few months back, uh, better known as Heal the Brain with Jane, and she has uh, her own entire university. Uh, it seems about brain care, and so, so Mimi, what what are you doing as a as a faculty member of Jane's? Yes, uh, so that was such a cool moment when she brought me into that. Um, she said, you know, if you could teach somebody in the community something, what would it be? And I said, well, you know, of course there's writing, of course there's comedy, but you know what I would love to learn more about that I think we really need is self-care. And so I'm teaching a self-care class for brain injury survivors of all kinds um, once a month through Like-Minded with um, Heal the Brain of Jane and also once a month with the Brain Injury Alliance of Colorado, which I also have um, a bit of a relationship here in Colorado. So um, it's something that I feel very passionately about as someone who burns out all the time. (laughs) And of course, I'm not, you know, a health expert, but I can speak from experience and encourage people to really learn those hard lessons of like, you know, you don't drink enough water. And, you know, it's okay to ask for space. It's okay to, um, to say no to people. It's okay to take a moment for yourself and just go outside for 15 minutes. You know, all these, these are all things that we, you know, it sounds pretty easy when you say it out loud, but it's actually very hard in practice. And especially for people who have gone through um, brain injuries, it's like, oh, well, I didn't know I should be doing that, (laughs) you know? Um, And so I I love teaching that. I wish I could do it in person. You know, I, I love being around people, but it's still just as impactful on doing them online. And and it, it just sort of makes it easier to reach even more people than around the country. And mm-hmm. and it and it's it's really a great group of people. Some of uh some of my favorite people and uh previous guests are part of that program, including, you know, folks like Joe and Kristen and Ella and Sagoina and Vince and a whole bunch mm-hmm. of folks who have done just some amazing work. Yeah, I mean, you really you've been around the block, you know, you know everybody. <laughs> you you know, well, it's just such a fantastic community. We we just yeah. keep coming back to that. Yeah. 
I really, I don't know what other communities are like, but ours is definitely the best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say that we're the best. Absolutely. We're number one. <laughs> it's a great counterpoint to one of the uh, neurologists I, I've, to one of the neurologists I've talked to who um, said to me that the problem with, uh, with stroke is that it is the least sexy of the neuro conditions. Put us up really? against the MS folks and some of the other folks to get all the fancy gym gear and stuff. <laughs> ah, yeah. You know, that's pretty interesting. I would say that. That, Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> interesting take. There we go. So, I mean, you're back in uh, back in Colorado now. Uh, the New York adventure is closed for the moment. So what's next? Oh, goodness. I really wish I could tell you. <laughs> Um, I am playing it kind of by ear at the moment, but, um, you know, I wasn't emotionally really ready to leave New York. So there's still a part of me that maybe wants to go back when the world is a little less crazy. Um, there's also thoughts of trying out LA or, you know, other cities that are comedy specific. I'm also working on another book. So for people that are ready for my next adventure, you know, I would say like, stay tuned on my next book. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm enjoying this kind of moment to at least try to relax and, you know, not paying rent. So I'm just like <laughs> hanging with my parents and their dogs and, you know, it's, it's a different way of life for me. And obviously this is temporary. Um, you know, I, I have so many dreams and especially when I was traveling with my show, like I wanted to just take that everywhere. And I think I still can, you know, <laughs> these are all things that, I've built for myself that they don't just go away because they need to be on hold. But, you know, I'm hoping to travel, hoping to share more of my comedy stuff. Um, something I was doing before pandemic and, um, you know, throughout my book launch was going into brain injury facilities and giving either keynotes at these big conferences or just leading little intimate kind of classes with, um, their survivors and being like, Hey, like, this is my journey. And this is how I'm doing comedy. And sometimes we'd like write jokes together with the, you know, survivors. And um, I had a lot of fun doing that. That's a really good times for me. So I'm hoping to go back to some of that community engagement, working with big organizations like that, and also just performing and getting back to the stage and without having to wear a bubble. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Although, I mean, you know, maybe, honestly, though, if I probably put like a plastic sh coating over my brain costume, that might work. <laughs> so really, I should get to, I should talk to my architect father about that and see if we can engineer something so yeah. that I could do comedy safely. <laughs> sort of expanding on the idea of the blood brain barrier. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So overall, um, do you wish you hadn't had your stroke? Oh, God, no. I'm so grateful for it. It's made me such a cool person. <laughs> I mean, there were so many times when I was like, wow, this is the lowest of the low, right? Like, I won't, I can't convince you otherwise. It was hard. It was terrible. But what's come out of it is like truly nothing I could have ever imagined for my life. I never would have told you I'd be a comedian, never would have told you I'd write a book. I would travel the world in a giant foam brain costume and, you know, make people laugh about my trauma. Like these sound like things that are not real, like, you know, and, and so the fact that I'm able to do all this now and that I, I was so fortunate in my recovery and that I worked so hard to get all my, you know, my life back, you know, that's really where I'm at. And I wouldn't, I would not trade that for the world. Are you kidding me? I'd probably be like a boring teacher. Like I'd be like, I don't know where I'd be. I don't want to know. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I love the life that I have for myself. And, um, you know, I can look back on it and, and learn all those things. And I also think it's very, it can be very cathartic to have kind of a near death situation in your, as a young person, because, um, it changes your whole perspective on life and people and things. And, um, I'm grateful for that too. So uh, I would not take it back for anything in the world. And that brings us to our hack of the week. Lean into it. If I, if something happens, I make a mistake or I bump into something, you know, I, I'm reminded of my limitations. I lean into it and I say, yeah, I meant to hit that wall with my shoulder. I wanted to get that bruise. That's what I did for myself. Look how beautiful it is. And I know that that sounds kind of strange, but 
Um, I can't sit in that woe is me, sad, you know, and I have those moments. Believe me, I do. Uh, we are, none of us are exempt from that. I'm not a bucket of sunshine all the time, you know, um, but I do really I love that, that phrase, a bucket of sunshine. <laughs> that's beautiful. I don't know if that's actually a saying. I think I just, it kind is of now. It's a bucket. I'm a bucket of sunshine. Um, <laughs> that goes on your website. I, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. That is good. I like that. I'm, I have to write that down. Otherwise, I'll forget it. Um, but, you know, and, and, and that in the classroom, too, I would forget things all the time. I would lose lose my my papers. I would, you know, forget what I was saying or my speech would be really bad that day. And I couldn't even like talk to my kids. And I would just lean into that and say, yep, you know, we're, mama's having a moment. You know, she's having a brain, a brain moment and um, kind of have a bit of release and acceptance around that. Because, you know, something that Joe says, too, is like radical acceptance, like you know, this is who you are. And, you know, it's not always perfect. And sometimes it hurts and it's painful. And it's not, you know, um, it's not amazing, but you really can make it amazing by accepting it and leaning into it, owning it. I mean, it can be, you can be so confident. I know some people in this community who, you know, are, are really still working on just getting any basic sense of their bodies back, right? They're, they still, they're walking with their AFOs or they're still in the wheelchair or they're, you know, they're walking off the curb today. That's their exercise. And I cheer them on and I'm like, yes, go, go, go. Because, you know, this is your life. This is what you're doing. And you just have to like double down on it. And, um, that can be hard, you know, when you're first starting out, but I think if anyone can do it, it's us and it's our community, you know, with everything that's facing us and how hard it is to be, somebody with an invisible disability, um, you know, you're really strong. Like, like my OT said, you know, she said, you're very strong, you're very brave and, um, you know, you can do hard things. So that's what I would say to my people. So if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? They can come find me on the uh, social medias. I'm at Mimi Hayes Brain. Uh, I'm at uh, MimiHayes.com, my website, Twitter, uh, all these things. I'm even on TikTok. I'm a little old to be on TikTok, Bill, <laughs> but I am on TikTok uh, for all the five people that see me do silly things there. Um, you can listen to my podcast, Mimi in the Brain. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple iTunes. Um, you can read my book. Uh, I'll be okay. It's just a hole in my head. It's on Amazon. You can just find all my things. You can just Google me and you'll find all these crazy things. Uh, so YouTube, all my stuff, it's uh, everything's out in the world for you. So come, come and play. (laughs) Awesome. And we'll have all those links over at strokegas.com slash Mimi. So Mimi, this has been This has been awesome. I've had so much fun, and I can't believe we have gone 12 minutes over our time. We've been talking for more than an hour. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you very much. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate it. You know, I have so many thoughts about this conversation, from just the power of the OT's words to the fact that they fixed Mimi's vision with little pieces of tape. And I'll go ahead and unpack a few of those things in this epilogue. But first, I want to get something off my chest. You see, as delightful as Mimi is, and as much fun as I had talking with Mimi, her story also makes me really angry. Her initial treatment by the medical industry was just horrible. The BFAST mnemonic that we talk about matters. Balance, eyes, face, arm, speech, time to call the ambulance. It's a simple message we want people to learn and we want people to act on. One of those symptoms means that this person could be having a stroke, loss of balance, change in vision, facial drooping, arm drooping, slurring of speech, or difficulty accessing language, all means time to call the ambulance. And time is essential to save a life and to reduce the level of disability. And let's look back at what happened here. Mimi lost her ability to balance. Mimi had double vision. Mimi struggled with language and to find words. I mean, it takes one element of BFAST to indicate a stroke, and Mimi had three. And yet the medical professionals she talked to 
basically shrugged their shoulders, told her to go home, and gave her a script for some uh, some vertigo meds. Multiple times. It took her mother actually threatening to sue everyone involved to get them to do the right thing and order an MRI. Her brain was bleeding. This could have gone so much worse had Mimi's mother not put the fear of God and the tort system into these professionals. And even after that, they kept trying to push her out of rehab early to deny her the therapy that would help her get better. And sadly, this type of thing happens often to younger patients, and it happens even more often to women and people of color, and it's unacceptable. Mimi is very lucky, and so are we to have her still with us. So I'll step off the soapbox now. We don't need to get all of our blood pressures up, uh, up and running again. On a happier note, another important lesson here is how Mimi talked about including the stroke content in her act. You see, in writing, it's important to write what you know. Building a comedy set is also about writing. It's about telling a story about how you see the world. And our stroke stories are a part of us now. They inform our worldview and the stories that we choose to tell. Avoiding the narrative of the stroke is, you know, completely disingenuous at best. Of course, that doesn't mean it's the only thing we talk about. I mean, as Mimi told us when talking about her last set before lockdown, we have other experiences that inform our lives too. And sometimes those are the stories to tell instead. The key is to tell the story that you most need to tell in that moment and make it your authentic story. So let's talk for a moment now about how Mimi got her book published, because this is another great story. You see, she did it through networking, through personal connections. Now, I know the first time most people hear that, it sounds like cheating, like only the special few can make it happen. But consider how Mimi did it. She made friends with people in her community. And she just connected with them. She wasn't seeking out somebody to publish her book. She was just getting to know people. And eventually, someone asked her about her writing and was in a position to pass along her manuscript. Professional networking isn't about going to a smarmy cocktail party and handing out business cards. It's about meeting people in your everyday life, your personal life, your professional life, and taking an interest in them. It's about the people you meet through work or church or inpatient therapy. It's about the people you connect with and message on social media that may be clustered around a hashtag. It's, uh, it's about the people whose posts you regularly comment on and who comment on yours. And sometimes it's, it's about finding two people you know who you think might want to know each other and then introducing them. Because ultimately, networking is about people and relationships. It's about recognizing people and supporting them and helping them, asking for advice and offering it. I mean, that's what it is. It's how I connect with many of my guests, in, including Mimi, and it's how Mimi got her book published. You see, you don't have to be a salesperson to build a network. You just have to be a person. Another important thread in this conversation was how Mimi talked about how she was burning out as a teacher while she was trying to pursue all these other things and had this, this greater calling to this creative life. But her teaching was just getting in the way of it and she wasn't getting, getting the value out of it, getting the fire out of it. And her friend just suggested quitting. Mimi's response of, can I do that? reminds me of, huh, you know, King George's response in Hamilton when he learned that Washington was stepping on, stepping down. And he said, I, I didn't know that was a thing you can do. You see, there comes a point in our busy lives where sometimes the most important thing we can do is just stop. 
You know, it's not always the right choice, but sometimes it is helpful to have wise friends who can help you navigate it. If you're overwhelmed with tons of projects and sacrificing your health or your well-being to get it all done, you can quit. If you're looking for someone to say you can, well, then I give you permission to quit and reboot. Finally, uh, it's okay to be proud of your accomplishments and to celebrate your victories. Even Mimi thinks her book is actually really good, and she laughs at the things she's written. More of us should be comfortable saying things like, you know what? I did good work. Unfortunately, our imposter syndrome often gets in the way of that, where even if we produce quality work, a lot of times we don't see the value in it or we don't believe there's value in it because we did it. And we're constantly thinking that there is somebody out there who is going to reveal us as a fraud. And so we're afraid to be proud of our stuff. We're afraid to put it out there in the world. But go ahead and put it out there in the world anyway. And I'll let you in on a little secret here. All those people you see, uh, whether in social media, traditional media, or wherever, at work, the 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 directors and the VPs and the C, CXOs and, and all of those folks, the vast majority of them think they're faking it. They feel that imposter syndrome at some times. They feel that at any point, somebody is going to come along and reveal that they really don't know what they're doing. That's pretty much everybody in the world. We're all just trying to get it done. And most of us don't believe in the true value of the stuff that we actually produce. Ultimately, though, really, we make some good stuff. And more of us should be comfortable saying things like, you know what? I did good work there. It's okay to celebrate your accomplishments. You don't always have to talk them down. In fact, you shouldn't. Because you see, neuroplasticity, that wonderful thing that enables us to walk and move and speak and swallow again after stroke, isn't just about getting function back after stroke. Repetition teaches the brain stuff. When we want to acquire new skills, when we want to do new things, when we want to practice all of that, neuroplasticity is great for that. But it works both ways. And if you continually talk trash about your own accomplishments, you are telling your brain that you can't accomplish things of value and that your accomplishments don't matter. And that is a dangerous path. So don't go down it. Speaking of directing your brain and healing your brain, Mimi is also part of Jane Connolly's like-minded program. Jane is, of course, better known as Heal the Brain with Jane, and we talked with her back in episode 105. The Like-Minded program is a membership program that features online classes that are taught by stroke and neurosurvivors and medical professionals. You can actually hear interviews with a lot more of Jane's faculty over at strokecast.com slash like-minded. So, be sure to check out the show notes for this episode or or head over to the uh, the website to find Mimi's book, I'll Be Okay, It's Just a Hole in My Head. You'll also find Mimi's website, her Instagram, her TikTok account, and more. Turns out she even has a Tumblr. All of that is available over at strokecast.com slash Mimi. And do you know anyone else who might be interested in Mimi's story? Go ahead and pull out your phone right now and text them the link, strokecast.com slash Mimi. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.